like to break up uh, events that are really fun with a little bit of intellectual content. So uh, I'm Jeff Cowan. I'm the uh, uh, professor at, at USC Annenberg School. And on behalf of the Annenberg School and of Politico, I want to welcome you all here to what should be a fascinating discussion. I know that this is one of those days in which people come in and out of things. Some of you want to look at the art in the museum. Some of you want to get to the convention uh, this evening. And some of you will have other events to get to. So there'll be a little coming and going as we go along. But I also want to say that in the audience is a remarkable group of people. And we're going to have a reception later. And I hope that during the reception, you'll all, many of you will get a chance to meet each other because we're, the room is filled with leading journalists, political figures, some very old friends of Barack Obama's, classmates of his who are here. Uh, and I think it's really going to be a, a, a fun and interesting event. Um, I want to thank the, um, the Denver Art Museum. Uh, and I want to uh, make a special thanks to the University of Denver School of Public Affairs and their Dean Paul Teske, who's here. And to give a, a quick uh, uh, the University of Colorado Denver School of Public Affairs. Uh, to, uh, to thank them for being here. And Paul Teske, who's the, uh, who's the dean of that school, to make a couple of welcome remarks. Paul. Um, the School of Public Affairs is delighted to be able to co-sponsor this event with uh, the Annenberg School and Politico. Um, the School of Public Affairs is the only comprehensive school uh, of its kind in the Rocky Mountain region. We offer uh, PhD, master's, and bachelor's degrees in public affairs, public administration, and criminal justice. And I see several of our faculty and students here today, and I'm delighted that they're here. And I, I welcome uh, those of you from the convention from out of town. Um, at the School of Public Affairs, in addition to uh, uh, excellent faculty and, and staff, we have a couple of media rock stars of our own. Um, Gary Hart, who is in the Worth Chair position in our school, is um, leading an activity uh, called the Presidential Climate Action Project, advising whoever the new president will be on things to do about climate action. He's um, a busy guy this week because he's not only a high-level supporter of Barack Obama, but he's also a good friend of John McCain and apparently was a groomsman at McCain's wedding. So he's kind of an interesting guy for the media. Uh, we also have our own local media rock star, Diane Carmen, who was the award-winning columnist for the Denver Post, now works for the School of Public Affairs. She helped put this event uh, and many others around town this week together. And we really appreciate uh, her great work on, on behalf of this. But we're delighted to have this fabulous uh, panel here. Um, just one quick comment before we start. About 15 years ago, um, uh, my scholarly study was in the area of communications policy. I'd go to various events. And that was about the time that the internet was just beginning to uh, take off. People were calling it distributed communications, weren't quite, quite sure where it was going. And one far-thinking panelist said, well, I think I envision a time when citizens aren't just consumers of information, but producers. And they'll be putting out information that we'll all read over this new technology. And I thought, no, that's, that's crazy. I'm not going to spend time listening to some person typing on their computer in their garage or in their pajamas or something. But 15 years later, I, according to my wife, do way too much of that, reading blogs, uh, looking at vlogs, writing occasionally my own blog. And I think it's, it's radically transformed you know, the way that media and politics uh, relate. And I think that's an important topic that I, I hope we'll hear something about today. At the same time, if I have what I think is a good idea, um, I think about trying to produce an op-ed for the Denver Post or the Rocky Mountain News or something to get it out more broadly to the thoughtful citizens of Denver and Colorado. So I think there's, we're in a fascinating time, a, a brew of different technologies and media uh, approaches to politics. And um, it's, it's very exciting in that regard. On the other hand, we have, you know, if you watched the Olympics recently, I, it seemed to me we couldn't go through in Denver a half hour of the Olympics without negative ads about Skip Udall, about big oil Bob Schaefer, about, you know, McCain's houses and whether Obama should have been vacationing in Hawaii. Um, and a lot of people think, you know, the media coverage ends up being too negative. So I hope we'll, we'll get to some of these interesting questions uh, with new perspectives, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you here. Thank you. Um, let me give you the order of battle for the, uh, for the day. Um, we're going to have a talk by Richard Reeves, which we'll, uh, I'll introduce in a minute. Then there we'll have the panel uh, discussion for about 45 minutes uh, to 55 minutes, moderated by John Harris. Uh, and then we'll open up to the uh, discussion with the audience generally for about 20 minutes. And I do urge you all to join in that conversation, to stay for that conversation, because as I say, in the audience today are people who would, many, many, many people who would be uh, terrific members of this panel. Uh, and then we're going to have a, we're going to follow that with a reception and book signing. Uh, and uh, Cass Sunstein and, and um, uh, Richard Reeves will be signing books. And I think that there are a couple of books that uh, Juan Williams just leave a little bit early will already have signed for people. And this session, follows one that we had in June of 07, 
uh, that was called uh, Ceasefire Bridging the Political Divide, and we actually, uh, Margaret Carlson is on the panel today, key, played a key role in putting that together. Juan Williams was part of it. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, Antonio Villaraigosa, Janet Peltano, uh, Kathleen Sebelius, and others were part of that conversation. And we're trying to follow that up today by thinking about the implications of the media in terms of the political divide. Uh, Richard Reeves, who of course is one of the uh, great uh, presidential biographers and one of the great uh, political journalists in America, uh, has written a paper which I think m many of you got on the way in. If you didn't, I hope you get on the way out. It's this paper which uh, reflects some of his own thoughts on this subject and uh, it condenses some of the comments that were made at that previous session. Please join me in, joining, in uh, welcoming Richard Reeves. Thanks. Uh, I think fewer of them are my thoughts than other people's uh, because I did travel around and talk to a number of people in both politics and the press about the question we have here. Uh, Bill Buckley, who I think will be missed, uh, when he began the National Review, said that his idea was to stand athwart history and yell stop. Well, we're here to stand athwart history and yell go. Uh, professors and journalists and all kinds of do-gooders who uh, rarely get their way. The conversation I remember best and I thought was most relevant to what we're trying to do and talk about was by Bob Mary, the president of Congressional Quarterly, who actually is a former student of mine, uh, who said, why the hell are you doing that? Uh, he said, if, if there is bipartisanship, uh, such a thing, or nonpartisanship, it's really kind of organic and cyclical. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, it is, uh, it can happen at certain times. It, it can be both good and bad. Uh, bipartisanship uh, and cronyism are not that far, to par far apart. And we've seen the hyper-partisanship of recent years. Many of us think that is not in the national interest either, but it's extremely difficult to bring together, uh, and more difficult these days, I think, uh, the two sides of, of many national questions, unless a candidate gets a mandate and probably has to get it in a time of national crisis, of war or of uh, true of, of climate change, something that will unite people and make them move. But that does not mean that those of us who are, are charged with watching uh, people with power uh, should not constantly try to push toward that and remind it, which I think is uh, remind uh, public officials uh, what, uh, who their real constituency is. Uh, which is all of the uh, people. And this, to me, seems to be a particularly opportune time in history, uh, partly opportunistic uh, oppor an opportunity because things have not been going well in some parts of the world, some parts of the economy. But we also have uh, two candidates who, in their own way, uh, represent change. Uh, uh, Barack Obama is by definition changed. A tabula rasa who, who suddenly appeared on the national scene, uh, and whatever we, whatever he does, will change. And if John McCain uh, should win the presidency in the wake of George W. Bush, uh, I think that the odds are great that he will be facing a heavily Democratic Congress and will be forced to try to govern uh, in a bipartisan way. So that as I travel the country, I talk to politicians and I talk to journalists, and the politician said that it was the journalist's fault, and the journalist said uh, that it was the, uh, the politician's fault. Uh, there was Juan Williams, who moderated the Annenberg program, had an exchange with Jay Carney of Time Magazine, in which Juan said, why are you uh, uh, why are you talking about this hyper-partisanship, et cetera? And Carney responded that we're just reflecting what is actually happened. Uh, the, uh, and it has all been driven, as most of life is, uh, by technology, which we're familiar with, the 24-hour news cycle, which means that it, you don't 
uh, only say something, it means that you say it every 10 minutes over and over and over again. Uh, how many kitchen tables do you have? Uh, we will go to our graves uh, trying to figure uh, that out. Uh, but that also represents a great democratization uh, of communication. Uh, every, uh, the old expression that freedom of the press belonged only to those who owned one, well, now everyone who has a cell phone is a network all by themselves, and we have to learn uh, to live with that. There have also been changes, other changes brought on by technologies, now is accepted as the jet plane. And I think one of the things that has done, which, which might come up here, is that, and certainly comes up in the paper I wrote, the politicians in Washington no longer know each other. They don't live together. Uh, the new Washington, where people jet in and jet out, uh, means that they're only there three days a week. They're working around the clock, and then they're back to their districts. Uh, Barack Obama uh, does, uh, does not live in Washington, or at least his family doesn't. And that has greatly changed. He's compared to Kennedy sometimes, but Kennedy was at every, Kennedy lived on N Street in Georgetown and was at every affair. He would walk to work sometimes with reporters, some of whom were mentors, other members of Congress. They would go to soccer games together at uh, St. Albans and uh, Sidwell and the other private schools, whatever party they were in. They knew each other and they knew how to deal with each other. That's no longer true. Each man is an island almost in Washington and leaves a permanent Washington which is filled with press and lobbyists, uh, and other people whose business uh, is not the public uh, business, and their business is certainly not governance. Uh, the, uh, in the process of doing the study uh, for this panel, uh, we tried to categorize uh, at USC the kind of questions that were asked during the presidential debates. And what we came up with uh, was that about 60 percent, there's more of that in the report, but about 60 percent of the questions asked seriously had to do with policy, with governance, and with the opinions uh, held by candidates. Then going back to uh, older uh, candidate debates into the 80s and 70s, uh, that percentage was not, rather than 60 percent now, was in the 80 and 90 percent range. I don't know how much per hour George Stephanopoulos and Charlie Gibson get for asking about flag pins, but it seems to me that they, uh, it's a pretty good deal. So those are the, uh, uh, the things that we're here to talk about. Do we have any capability and influence, those of us somewhat outside the process, of pushing, uh, pushing the people who run the country, who legally run the country, govern the country, uh, in a direction of more cooperation and more serious efforts not to humiliate each other, but to deal seriously with the problems facing the nations, which we all know. And I'll end by saying that uh, I would hope uh, that we will uh, end up with a president uh, who says and means uh, that I intend to be president of all the people, especially of those of you who voted against me. Thank you. Thanks to our hosts, uh, and Politico is uh, delighted to be a part of this. This is, a, as you can tell, a pretty classy panel. We've got some of the most experienced uh, political journalists in the country. We've got uh, in, in Cass one of uh, uh, the most important public intellectuals in the country. Uh, so I think this is going to be a good discussion. I also wanted to thank my colleague at Politico, uh, Beth Freerking, for helping uh, uh, assemble this panel. Uh, I thought I'd give you a little bit of uh, context on my own uh, uh, perspective on these questions that uh, Richard uh, raises um, uh, with respect to what he and, and many people see as a decline in uh, a decline in our civic culture and uh, the media's culpability in that. Uh, as you all know, this is a time of despair, uh, generally. Uh, in the media business. I think specifically in our line of work, political journalism, that despair is widely uh, felt. Uh, the, the 
really the most the proximate causes that our economic model uh, uh, under which big news organizations for many decades prospered, uh, that's being challenged. Uh, but that's led to something I think more profound, which is our moral model uh, is being challenged. Uh, what I mean by that is if you were a reporter uh, uh, in the top ranks of political journalism in the past, you felt uh, that you, uh, uh, you were performing worthwhile work. Uh, 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 that this was a, a, a worthy way to spend a career. Uh, and what's more, it was relevant work. You were having impact. I think a lot of journalists, a lot of my colleagues, uh, uh, no longer necessarily feel that. Uh, we, we do indeed uh, uh, feel vulnerable to the kind of criticism that Richard levels, that we're trivializing the process, or that our serious work goes unnoticed as we uh, uh, talk about uh, sort of more ephemeral issues. Um, uh, but the old ways, uh, in the old times, we, we felt we were doing important work and we were having a hell of a lot of fun while doing it, uh, and that's less true. So that has contributed to an atmosphere of, of pessimism in the business. Uh, two years ago, a little less than two years ago, uh, uh, my colleague at the Washington Post, Jim Vanda High, uh, and I teamed up with uh, Robert Albritton, who's the publisher of Politico, and uh, started this new publication. That, uh, it, it was, in a very real sense, a uh, response to the pessimism it was starting this we felt was an act of optimism, uh, that I do think that there's a, uh, uh, a robust future for quality journalism, uh, and I do think it's going to be supported uh, not by uh, charity or uh, a nonprofit status, but by a robust business model. Uh, in fact, I think it's essential uh, to good journalism that uh, uh, you uh, uh, figure out a way to s uh, be self-sustaining rather than being the, uh, the ward of... Uh, uh, of some rich foundation or, or some rich person. Uh, so we're in business to uh, um, produce good journalism, make money, and also sort of recover that, uh, that old era of having fun while doing it. Um, uh, there's two ideas that I think are relevant to, uh, on, on Richard's themes that are behind Politico. One is that we live in an entrepreneurial age in journalism where the characteristics and the skills of the reporter matter more than the institutional platform on which he or she works. Uh, in the old days, what mattered was where you worked. You could be your Smith or Jones of the New York Times, and you're important uh, because you work for the New York Times or CBS News. Uh, it, I could point you to all kinds of examples of people who are now important in driving the conversation about American politics uh, who either don't have an institutional platform, somebody like Matt Drudge, uh, or they have uh, uh, an institutional platform, which is uh, really kind of secondary. Uh, they are the franchise. Uh, uh, my friend Mark Halpern, uh, uh, I think, is an example of that. He's become one of the most important journalists in, in, uh, uh, in the sort of modern media. Uh, and he's now at Time, but before that, uh, he, he was at ABC News. Really, I'd say where he is at any given moment is irrelevant. Mark is the brand. People are... <laughs> uh, uh, but people want Halpern's take rather than Time Magazine's take, writing as the, the, the sort of voice of God. That's a big, big change in the business, uh, uh, that we're now in an entrepreneurial age where individual journalists are the franchise. Uh, I happen to think, this is my particular bet on where media is going, that we also live in an age of specialization. Uh, in the old days, the New York Times could set the national uh, agenda by the decisions of the front page editor, what's on the, what's going to be there, and that was going to drive the conversation at the networks and uh, at regional papers around the country. Uh, who told us what was important? The people running the New York Times or the Washington Post, uh, what they thought uh, uh, was important. In this era, everybody is his or her own editor, and they decide what they're interested in and how deep they want to go. I think that was led to uh, uh, specialization of news sites. Uh, Politico, all we write about is politics uh, and Washington governance. And uh, um, I happen to think that's the future rather than the, the sort of general interest uh, news publication that covers sports and financial news and foreign news uh, as well as politics. I could be wrong about that. That's where we put our chips on the table. So I am optimistic. I, I'm kind of professionally optimistic. If you put me on truth serum, and I took a shot of it before coming here, look, the fact is I'm not uh, really all that optimistic. I think what Richard says uh, 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 is, uh, uh, is true, that there, it's very much an open question uh, that uh, uh, whether we are uh, sort of meeting our most solemn commitment uh, as journalists, which is uh, to be advancing the, the public interest and in, enlivening uh, uh, the public debate and illuminating serious issues uh, rather than just uh, 
or creating an echo chamber which trivializes uh, the work of politics. And I think that's very much a jump ball. Um, and I think that jump ball is what we're, we're going to discuss today. Uh, but there's no question there, there's sort of profound doubts as to uh, whether the business has got a financial future. And as I say, uh, I think in some sense a moral future. Uh, I think yes, but it's a guarded yes. Uh, with that, I thought I would turn first to Karen, who is a representative of really the kind of one of the classic traditional news organizations. In some sense, it's the sort of polar opposite of Politico. Uh, to get your take uh, briefly on this, Karen, and then turn to Cass, who's written a book uh, uh, which uh, really delves in a lot of these themes, whether the new, the, the, the new trends in news media are, in fact, uh, sort of eroding the middle ground on which uh, uh, democracy depends. So, Karen, tell me, are, are you having fun, and are you doing worthwhile work? Well, it depends on what week we, we're talking about here. Um, but it is true that in the past, it's amazing how short, can you guys hear me okay, this time frame is. But just the last 18 months, my job has changed so much. Um, because we are trying to figure out how to make the business model work in an environment where people don't get their information off of slick, glossy pages. And not as many people are buying advertising to do it that way. And I, it really sort of came home to me because Time started having a bunch of us blog last year and made the decision that we were going to attempt to engage the blogosphere on its own terms, which meant we opened the whole thing up to comments, which means you get the full flood of intensity that you get in the blogosphere. And I actually uh, try to go down and, and interact with the commenters, because I, I've decided that if there's any way that this model is going to work in the future, and we're going to have to sort of meet the web world on its own terms, which means it's going to be interactive and there's going to be a lot of give and take. But the degree to which my own job had changed really came home to me on uh, at the end of January last year, where I got this phone call late at night from Teddy Kennedy's people. And they said, Ken we all knew Kennedy was going to go out and endorse Barack Obama the next day. And it was going to be a very, very, very big deal at American University. So they said, would you like to be the only reporter behind the scenes? We'll take you backstage, bring a photographer, um, so you can do a story on this for the magazine. So of course I jumped at it. But the event happened on a Monday morning. Our magazine did not hit the newsstands until Friday night. And in the course of the time between Monday and Friday, I did at least four blog posts on what it was like back there. I wrote a story for time.com. I did several podcasts of the actuality of my, you know, interviews with Senator Kennedy and Caroline and Obama as they're going on and off stage. And Wednesday night, Wednesday I got a call from the Daily Show that they wanted me to come on and talk about this. So by the time that this information appeared in what we laugh about now is dead tree time. Um, it had been <laughs> through just about every conceivable medium imaginable. And I do think that this is really forcing us to think about the information that we are handling in a different way, uh, to think about it in a much more interactive way, in a much more immediate way. You know, I don't know that that these mainstream media institutions are going to be the ones who actually figure out how to get us to the other side of the River Jordan here, but I, I'm convinced the other side is there, and somebody is going to figure it out. And you know, in the meantime, it's you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, and we'll we'll just see where it goes. But it has it's also changed the nature, I think, of our interaction with our sources because, for instance. A few months ago, Barack Obama got on his campaign plane wearing blue jeans. You know, this is not a very big deal, except that when the entire back of the plane is populated with these generally 20-something young journalists who have these little tiny cameras, it became a huge deal because these people had never seen Barack Obama in blue jeans before. And it was like there was a riot breaking out in the back of the plane as they were all climbing over there. And the YouTube video is just hilarious to watch because, you know, the cameras are all moving around and people, get out of my way, I've got to. Um, 
and so I think in some ways knowing that every single act is going to be caught that way and all over the web that way the second it happens has really in some ways made it a lot harder for those of us who you know think of of ourselves as analysts of information as opposed to just raw purveyors of information to do our job and I think that that is one of the reasons by the way that you are seeing sort of the trivialization of things even as hallowed as presidential debates. Thanks Karen. Um, I try not to be uh, romantic ever uh, about the past because it's, uh, it's almost always unjustified when you go back and actually look at how things worked in the past but the world I described where a handful of big newspaper editors and network uh, TV executive producers could set the agenda was not terribly democratic, but nor was it all that bad. Uh, uh, they were generally responsible people making those judgments. Uh, and they did give us a, a sort of a common set of facts and assumptions around which to argue. Uh, and it seems to me that's one of the things that has changed with the proliferation of news media. That uh, uh, as everybody becomes his or her own editor, they gravitate to places that uh, that uh, um, feed them the kind of interest, uh, the things that they're interested in, but also accept their their uh, uh, ideological and cultural prisms. And what you have is people talking to each other rather than talking about a common set of facts. And uh, that, to me, is something I'm concerned about. And Cass, I'd like to you to uh, give your own take on that. Uh, how big a concern of that, is, and how much of this is uh, is just hyperventilating? The, you know, okay. uh, I'll, I'll tell you about a little experiment involving Colorado, actually, and maybe I'll ask you to guess what would happen. Uh, we got people in Boulder together uh, to talk about three issues, uh, civil unions for same-sex couples, climate change, and affirmative action. And we wanted them to record their views anonymously and privately before they talked to one another. That was step one. Step two was to deliberate together, if they could, to a group verdict on those issues. And step three was to record their views privately and anonymously after they had talked. We wanted to make sure the Boulder people were liberal. Uh, we thought they probably would be, and we had a few little tests. We asked them what they thought of Vice President Cheney. <laughs> and if they liked him, they were cordially excused from the yeah. experiment. Uh, on the same day, actually, we did the same thing in Colorado Springs, which is a conservative place. We had them to dis discuss exactly the same issues for a period and have these three stages of, uh, of views recorded. What do you think would happen to people's private anonymous statement of views after they talk with like-minded others? Okay. Here, here's what's ha what happened. Three, three things. First, the people in Boulder began by liking an international agreement to control climate change. After talking to one another, they loved an international agreement to control climate change. The people in Colorado Springs didn't much like affirmative action when they started. After they talked with each other, they hated affirmative action, thought we should get rid of it yesterday. Uh, the people in Colorado Springs didn't much like same-sex civil unions, but after they talked, they thought this was uh, the most ridiculous and horrible idea they'd ever heard. So they got more extreme. That was the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is they got much more uniform in Boulder and in Colorado Springs. I've seen the tapes, and some of the people in Colorado Springs said, well, you know, same-sex civil unions, maybe that's okay. And some of the people in Boulder said, I'm not really that sure about climate change. How serious is it? Uh, after they talked to one another, they were in, in lockstep in Boulder and in lockstep in Colorado Springs. As a result, the gap between the two communities widened very dramatically. Um, we wanted to say something, to learn something about what happens in a communications universe in which people are able to sort themselves into communities of like-minded types. So we think on the internet that something like our Colorado experimenting, our Colorado experiment is happening every 10 minutes of every day as millions of Americans are going to the communication sources that they like and trust most and basically listening exactly to that. Not just with respect to points of view, by the way, but also with respect to topics. 
If you compare the universe that I'm describing, which was described in the mid-90s with great enthusiasm by an MIT technology prophet, uh, with enthusiasm, he described it, as the daily me, that we can construct a daily me that's just us, uh, you, that's just you. It's your communications universe, the one you like. Uh, uh, if you compare the daily me, which really is kind of what we did in Boulder and Colorado Springs with the old media, uh, there are three things that are lost. One is serendipity. So with Time or Newsweek or even Fox News, even with its political orientation, you can get brought up short a bit by a point of view or a topic that you never would have included in your communications universe. Serendipity is lost by the replacement of what we might think of as, a, as an architecture of serendipity with a new architecture of control. The second thing that's lost is mixing. So if you can construct a communications cocoon, as many bloggers do, by the way, as they jump from one like-minded site to another, uh, you, can, uh, you can ensure that there isn't mixing between Colorado Springs and Boulder, that it's just the types you like. So mixing is lost. On New York Times, even though it has, I guess, basically a liberal bent, there's a significant degree of mixing. And the same is true of uh, most daily newspapers when they're doing their jobs. The third thing, referred to is the uh, disintegration of a shared communications culture. Now, th that disintegration isn't only lamentable. It has some values, too. It gets a lot of information and facts and perspectives out there in the, in the world. But the loss of a shared communications universe does uh, present some problems. It sometimes makes it difficult for people to understand each other. Sometimes their views of their fellow citizens are contemptuous. Sometimes outrage becomes the currency of the realm. And I'll just close by saying, if it's the case that our Colorado experiment does replicate what's happening for millions of Americans, then there is a terrible warning there, where by, after the experiment was done, the people in Boulder really thought the people in Colorado Springs were um, not just wrong, but either horribly confused or actually acting from bad faith. So as at the result, at the end of our little experiment, accusations of bad faith became uh, pervasive. Done. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, let's, let's go to Margaret and then Juan. Uh, Margaret, you're kind of like me. You got sort of one foot in the old media. You know, I, I, my, most of my journalistic values come from the 21 years uh, I spent at the Washington Post, but here I am in a new media venture, and you've been at Time and elsewhere, but you, Bloomberg is, in its own way, is a new media venture. I think pretty profitable one, too, from what I've read. Uh, one of the few places is expanding. Uh, I think I'm old media because I'm old, but um, <laughs> mostly because I'm old. Are things that dire? What do you make of all this? <laughs> well, I, when I get up in the morning, I now do different things than I did 10 years ago. When I go to the doorstep and see the newspaper, I think it's yesterday's paper. I have it in my bag here. I may or may not finish it, but then I, the, the, the next thing I do is go to Real Clear Politics to see if my column's been picked up and who else is there. Uh, and then a couple of blogs, and maybe I'm watching Morning Joe. But the paper is the least of it because it's old. Um, and your Colorado Springs and Boulder people, I think, are the epitome of cable TV, which drives so much. Which is, it's when I get a when I uh, uh, hosted Crossfire, um, my friend Michael Kinsley and I would often get said into our ear, "Could you get a little angrier?" <laughs> and the truth is, neither one of us have that much of the angry personality, mm -hmm. but even 10 years ago on Crossfire, that was what was needed. Now, I will get called by shows I won't mention, <clears throat> or maybe I will. Okay, Keith Oberman's show. And if I'm not as upset about something as MSNBC's Keith Oberman show is, then I won't be on the show. Um, Does that make you mad? Uh, <laughs> no, it means I get to have dinner without, um, and, you know, Fox actually never asks questions because they just want me to come on and be a punching bag, and the more 
I disagree with them, the better. And the stupider I am, the better. Um, but cable pushes people, and not just journalists and the shows themselves. MSNBC is now um, become very much a liberal, uh, and perhaps if you believe the Hillary people and Obama network. Uh, but the politicians, the elected officials who get on the shows are also the ones who are operating at the further reaches because they don't want the reasonable people on because it's not what cable is. The people who tune in are like the people in Boulder and Colorado Springs. They want to hear what they want to hear. The cable networks have to be the cable of me, uh, and that's who they attract. At the conference that uh, Jeff moderated in, in LA, uh, Michael Bloomberg was one of the uh, panelists, and he pointed out that mayors and governors are far less partisan, and that states and cities work better than uh, the Capitol, than Congress, partly because of the way we elect uh, especially congressmen. Those districts are drawn almost entirely to suit somebody or other. And neither party has an interest in changing it because each party has its seats that they're going to win by being totally who they are, very liberal or very conservative. They get to Washington and they're representing those people and that's, they're going to get reelected unless they are Mark Foley or Larry Craig or somebody. So there's no incentive for them to come to the middle. Um, governors and mayors actually can't afford gridlock because they have to pick up the trash. You know, they have to solve crimes. They have to make the, the city safe. So they're much more likely not to fall into these categories that now have us shouting at, at each other most of the time. Um, and the other thing is, the consumers of this, the dogs like the dog food. They want the questions about the flag lapel pins. They want the questions about the houses. If nobody was consuming it, it wouldn't be sold. So there's some of what you, you get, um, what you want. Uh, and otherwise, would, the cable, would these cable TV stations put it out? I, I don't think so. Right. Juan, if there was ever a time for uh, our business to be at the top of its game, it would be this election cycle. There have been polls if you ask people, uh, is this a high stakes election? Does it really matter? Uh, at record levels, people are saying yes, it really does matter as opposed to, yeah, I think we could all point to some elections where at least there was a perception that it, the, uh, it, it, it didn't especially matter all that much. This one does. You've got uh, the obvious uh, sort of racial context to this election potentially a very volatile issue. This would be a year for our business to really be at its best. You know, yeah, we've all seen like, and heard plenty of examples where we're not really at our best. What do you make uh, of what Margaret said? Uh, you know, I plug into the... I take back the part about Fox. That's okay. <laughs> no offense. I love it. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm totally in sync with this idea that of the fragmentation both of the media and of the audience. Uh, just today when I was signing books outside and people would come up and say, hello, John, uh, half the people would say, oh my gosh, uh, you're Juan Williams from NPR. I listen to politics and NPR all the time. You guys do a great job. Thanks. And the next person would come up and say, oh, you're Juan Williams from Fox. Uh, you know, just terrific, you know, and it's the, never the same person, you know, I noticed yeah. that, you know, it's two different worlds that are represented, and you can never tell which world it is, uh, they don't seem to have too much in common. But I take it that what we're talking about here um, today really is a representation of something much larger, and again, John, I think you touched on it when you said, you know, this, the significance of this election in part has to do with the idea that we have two very unusual candidates. Uh, to some extent, there's no way that you could have in any previous cycle thought that you could have had a white woman or a black man as the nominee on the Democratic Party side or had someone who, for most of his career, has been as unorthodox a Republican as John McCain. Uh, and I think that's evidence of the d large 
degree of discontent in the society, people saying we're on the wrong track in general, uh, close to 80 percent. But also something that uh, strikes me as much more significant, which is the tremendous rate of demographic change taking place in the society. So that right now, um, you come into a, a, a demographic where there are lots of young people who are extremely interested in politics and seeking that intense change. Uh, I'm always knocked out by the idea that, in fact, uh, I think it's over a quarter of the American population is under the age of 18. Uh, you know, Margaret and I just can't understand it, but it's true. And uh, when you start to talk to those young people about politics, uh, their sense of uh, idealism shines through, and it shines through uh, with a certain degree of conviction. Uh, it's not that they feel as if they don't know enough. To the contrary, they think that the old folks are too partisan, too stuck in their ways, too racist, uh, too indifferent to the quality of our air and environment, uh, not understanding uh, how you go about diplomacy instead of uh, taking up military arms. So that generation, I think, is looking for its information in different places in different ways. When I ask people, uh, if I'm on a college campus, hey, where do you get your information? Uh, people say to me, oh, you know, I turn on the radio in the morning. Unfortunately, they don't say NPR, <laughs> but they say things like Howard Stern or, or Imus or, uh, you know, some morning show. It could be everything from gospel music, uh, you know, to the sports guys or whatever. They get information there. They talk about information that comes for them during the day in the course of things like Rush Limbaugh, Oprah Winfrey. Uh, then at the end of the day, they're talking to me about uh, the cable channels as a prime source of information. And here you're getting everything from Oberman to O'Reilly, uh, these personality-driven shows. And of course, the personality-driven shows occur within a context of niche programming done by CNN, Fox, MSNBC. Um, and every little niche, all, every little audience has its niche and it has a specific appeal in the way the story is told. We have literally, from the time I got involved with journalism, gone full circle. We've gone from Walter Cronkite, who I viewed, you know, when I was a little kid as sort of a trusted, neutral source of news. We've gone from that concept of Uncle, Uncle Walter, we've gone to O'Reilly. You know, and if everybody says, oh, yeah, well, you know, the kind of the cranky, highly opinionated, feisty guy who wants to fight about everything, gods, gays, guns, every fight that you can pick, he wants to get on it, and he wants you to know what he thinks, and what he thinks drives the show much more so, as Margaret says, much more so than what any guest. The guest is there simply as a foil for the lead personality. So you get this very interesting fragmentation of the audience and of the shows, and this is the world, this is the new world media. Now, on a very serious level, which is what we had done in Los Angeles, we talked about, well, what impact does this have on American politics in terms of the hyper-partisanship that has been on display? And you get politicians like Schwarzenegger or Bloomberg or Janet Napolitano who work across political lines. And one of the appeals actually coming from both McCain and Obama is that they say they're capable of breaking that partisan gridlock in Washington. I don't know because obviously campaigns drive people to be more partisan in order to establish that base, to maintain the base. But when you stop and think about what is going to actually end by, uh, create bipartisanship and the, 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 the gridlock, most often in Washington these days it comes down to, it's unbelievable to me, but it seems to be self-evident, big business. Big business says, wait a second, We've got a problem with health care when the cost of health care is driving us out of business or becoming prohibitive, and we need you guys on Capitol Hill to come up with some reasonable solution. Big business will say, you know what, we need immigration reform. And even when you get the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Chamber of Commerce all working on it, still they can be thwarted by sort of grassroots populism that will oppose immigration reform, but they're the ones driving to try to get something done. If you talk about the environment, I can go on with these issues where it's big business that's trying to create positive social change in a way that I think uh, might surprise some people. So in this campaign, when you say, well, is the media doing a good job, 
I go with what Margaret said. The dogs like the food. They like this niche partisan approach that appears uh, from their radio shows in the morning through Oprah and Limbaugh in the middle of the day to the cable channels at night. That's where people get their information. That's the way they seem to want it these days. It grieves me, and I guess no. you too, John, that the Washington Post is not the... You know, when I, I pick up the Washington Post because I'm a big Washington Wizards and Washington Nationals fans. My son, when he wants to know sports scores, he goes to the internet. And I say to him, well, what about all the other sports news? Well, he doesn't want to read about any other teams. He just wants his news. That's the story today. And uh, I think it's leading to the demise of so many of our big American newspapers. I want to toss back in a second to Cass, because several of the things he said uh, sort of naturally beg a response from him. I wanted to just make one aside, though, of, to me, one of the, at the practical level, one of the most frustrating ways about the, of the uh, frustrating things about the change of the news cycle isn't the ideological, uh, it's just how it's shredded our attention span. I can point to so many examples of like serious journalistic enterprise that should have had big and lasting impact and in an earlier era would have, would have basically reframed our assumptions uh, uh, you know, about this particular race. Uh, and it gets a bounce for a day or two, or maybe it lands on the wrong day so it doesn't get any bounce. Uh, and then it just kind of dissipates because something else uh, will come to take its place. And you know, I find as an editor, I can't even remember what it was that we were all up in arms about, you know, a month ago. It was like, uh, something, Hillary Clinton's pastor is uh, having an affair with a Muslim or something like that. <laughs> I, I, it, something like that. Uh, we can't, it's shredded our memory, and it's, uh, and it's uh, uh, shredded our ability to focus on important things. And I think that is just as, in a way, just as profound as sort of the ideological dimension that you're talking about. Karen, you well, had something before? Well, I would just argue, though, that occasionally the opposite happens, where there's a story out there that the kind of collective wisdom of the, you know, media heavies isn't important, and it's the blogosphere that picks it up. For, and I think the first story that this happened with was Trent Lott's comments about Strom Thurmond, which were heard by any number of reporters in the room of big media organizations who just laughed and didn't even write it. And it was, you know, the jungle drums of the blogosphere. And the same is true, I think, the U.S. attorney scandal was something that you know, it was out there, it was kind of atomized, but it took a blogger, Josh Marshall, to right. to put together the dots and, and he, you know, he won a Polk Award for it. And those were important, I think, important stories. Yeah, I do agree. That it works both ways. Uh, Cass, uh, the politicians who have been visiting our workspace over at the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, at the Pepsi Center, a number of them have saying, like, uh, Barack Obama needs to do a show. He's tough. They need to uh, uh, he needs to hit back. Needs to be more partisan, uh, even if it means surrendering this kind of uh, what had been his, uh, his his profile of representing a new uh, kind of transformational, unifying brand of politics. So like, you know, forget all that. You're in a fight here. You know, get tough. I'm curious, as a friend and informal advisor, what you think about that. Uh, and you know, on the larger theme, you described the sort of problem well with your Boulder versus Colorado Springs story, but you didn't really touch uh, uh, on what the proposed remedy for that is. Uh, maybe we've got to buy the book uh, for that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I guess I think that in terms of the, uh, to the extent that we have a world where people are living in Colorado Springs or living in Boulder in terms of the cocoons they're constructing for ourselves. There are two reasons that might be happening. One is it's consumer driven that people are making those choices and the other is that producers uh, are doing it for some reason which may include consumer demand. And if, it, to, if it's a problem, there are two sorts of types who can respond. One is that each of us as citizens can make choices that sometimes counteract what's comfortable. And we can maybe have a civic culture that looks more like that than one of self-sorting. And those who provide information on uh, Time or Newsweek or 
uh, the New Republic or the National Review or the Weekly Standard. They can uh, participate in the construction in a world that looks like it's full of Boulder and Colorado Springs, or they can counteract it and, and have something more that has mutual respect and mixing. So uh, I think this should be done voluntarily and not through government regulation. But to, to say human beings are just like this, is, is, isn't right, that the extent to which we have this phenomenon is a function of what sort of civic culture each of us participates in creating, and that no individual can, can do a whole lot, but each individual can do a little bit. So there, there is a book called The Long Tail, which I think is kind of an important signal here. It's by Chris Anderson, the editor at one point of Wired magazine. And he celebrates the nicheification of the United States. So I loved uh, Juan's comments about uh, just looking at your favorite sports teams because there's something larger there. And this is what Anderson is adoring and celebrating and kind of ecstatic about. And there is something to it in terms of learning and convenience, but what he's lost sight of is the democratic aspirations that nichification confounds. So if we see the long tail as what we're celebrating, rather than something more like James Madison's very different vision of a national republic where there's a lot of heterogeneity and lots of people are jarring together as what we're celebrating, then we will, what we, what we celebrate, what we construct depends on what we, are, uh, what we want to celebrate, yes, what our values are, as well as the economic, these interact. That gets us directly to Obama. And I don't have any particular political advice for my longtime colleague. He seems to know a lot more about that than his his colleagues at the University of Chicago Law School do. But I uh, do have something to say about what type he is. And he's, he's a Madisonian type. He's not a uh, information cocoon type. So just by nature, he doesn't think, I live in Boulder and the Colorado Springs people are stupid or evil. He says, you know, the, in his book, The Audacity of Hope, he says, Americans know that uh, it's good to recognize that the other side might have a point. That's kind of where he, where he lives. So uh, what would help his electoral prospects? Who knows? But, but usually when people aren't themselves, uh, they look like they're not themselves. And his self really is not a red states, blue states, McCain's horrible. That's, that's just not him. Right. We're going to open it up in just a second to uh, audience questions. I, I was going to just, in a way, bounce off of something Karen said. Uh, uh, you know, about looking at the, uh, the, the sort of more upbeat nature of these trends in media, uh, because they are there. I do think tends to be, Karen, there tends to be people like our generation who like have the most uh, sort of furrowed brows about this, because you know, we're looking at another 20 years in the business and things are rapidly changing and we kind of like the old way and we're comfortable in it and we're not so sure we're comfortable in the new way. Uh, for younger people, and I, I've hired a lot of younger people as a, uh, the editor of a new publication, I find like they just don't uh, wring their hands and, and furrow their brows over this subject. They kind of, uh, and I think many of them say, ah, oh, we're sort of overreacting. Uh, you know, this stuff comes out in the wash, and yes, things are, maybe the debate's sort of more hyper-partisan, but uh, people are also have their own filters about it and can kind of sort out and reach sensible judgments about things. Uh, that's generally in the context of where's our, our civic culture going, specifically within the context of journalism. Uh, and I do wonder about this, because people you know, send me resumes and want to be hired, and I'm like, you're 23, like, why do you want to get in the news business? Like, what, what, you know, are you sure? Uh, and they're totally sure, uh, and, and they're correctly sure, because the reality is the breakdown of the old order in uh, media uh, has uh, led to a big proliferation of opportunities uh, uh, for younger reporters. And, uh, you know, even at Politico, we've got people who are, like in, say, Ben Smith uh, covers the Democratic race for us, uh, or uh, uh, Jonathan Martin on the, in the Republican race. You know, they're in their late 20s, early 30s. I think anybody would say, well, they're among the most important people. Uh, I think the campaigns would say that themselves would say this. They're driving uh, a lot of the conversation about national politics. Under the sort of traditional world that I grew up in, they'd be 10 or 15 years away from uh, having equivalent positions uh, uh, where they're the, the, the next Dan Baltz at the Washington Post uh, or the next Adam uh, 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 Nagarni at the New York Times or something like that. So, I mean, look, we're in this era of massive fluidity, and, you know, things tend to work out pretty well, is my own uh, kind of. Uh, uh, sort of bias on this, I guess, but I think it's a bias supported by some evidence. 
Jim. We're going to take this to the floor, and I'd like people to, we have microphones over here. We are taping this, so it's much more helpful if you're out of mic. If you can line up with the mics. Before I call on people mics, uh, I want to thank Juan Williams for being a part of this. Juan, thank you so much. I know you have another, you have to get on the air in a few minutes. So Juan, please join me in thanking Juan for being a part of this. Uh, you know, I wanted to say one thing about old media and young people. Um, the Olympics is the, the first recent event in which young people realize that there's something really nice when everybody around the water cooler has the same reference points. They don't know what that's like. And it's so good. You're, you're, you, you don't have to explain. Because usually they're watching something on MTV, and I may be watching something on, I don't know, the History Channel, or not that high, but something, something lower, much lower. But <laughs> nonetheless, we're not watching the same thing. So it's a wonderful thing when that comes back. Uh, I also want to ask people to introduce themselves. I mentioned earlier we have a remarkable audience here. And if you would introduce yourself before you ask the question, uh, please go to it, George. Uh, George Vredenberg, um, a former uh, CBS, uh, Fox, uh, and Time Warner and AOL for just history's sake, now retired. Um, I'd be curious about the interplay of the forces you described with the business models, because my impression is still that the evening news in the aggregate, the three of them, will out um, rank in terms of actual viewer numbers cable channels, that in fact Time Magazine and Newsweek will still outrank in terms of aggregate numbers the number of people who read blogs. Uh, but you know the economic model of cable television is different from advertising supported broadcast television. Do we end up in a world that is in fact stable where you have some balanced media which exist and some opinionated media still exists, or does the business model end up driving the balanced media out? That is, to what extent does the business model, uh, different business models of these different media, uh, going to have an impact on uh, which of the particular mix of media continue through time? Somebody want to take that? John, you're outside you've got my a pay grade, above but, my pay grade. But John, grade. you've got a business model, so maybe you could talk about that for a second from your perspective. I think just as we've been talking about how much noise and static there is in our, our daily sort of journalistic dialogue, uh, advertisers face that same challenge. How do they get their message, whether it's to buy cornflakes or to, you know, uh, you know support ethanol or, uh, you know, clean coal or something like that? Everybody who has a message of any kind. Uh, as an advertiser faces a real challenge in breaking through and being heard. I think that makes sites in which it is very easy to identify the interests and char demographic characteristics of who is reading that content much more compelling from an advertiser point of view. And uh, I do think that uh, 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 casts a shadow on the evening news. And you know, they do have large audiences. Uh, and demographically, they're, they're older audience. So we get a lot of ads for Depends, uh, uh, um, you know, on, on the CBS News or, or, or something like that. I don't mean that frivolously, but it, I mean, it's uh, or entirely frivolously. Uh, uh, but it's true. Uh, and I also think in terms of the phrase we use at Politico and we th uh, a lot, and we give a lot of thought to it, uh, 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 is how to drive the conversation. And by what I mean by that, it's like, oh, did you see that story? Did, or what about this? Uh, to both drive what people are talking about, and, and even if you can't drive it to, in very real time, reflect what people are talking about. Uh, and s small news outlets can have a much, a very disproportionate uh, impact on what's driving the conversation. It is rare these days, I would say, as a, myself as a political journalist, maybe Margaret and uh, Karen have a different view of it, that that the any of the three evening news uh, 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 broadcasts are driving the conversation like, oh my gosh, CBS led with X uh, tonight. Uh, and that's not really, I mean, in a way that's not surprising. I think Reader's Digest is still the, probably the biggest publication in the country or the world, but it's not very often, you go, oh my gosh, did you see that uh, you know, piece on Obama uh, in Reader's Digest? It's just not how it works. You'd be much more likely to say, did, gosh, there's something new up about Obama on Talking Points Memo, and that would be driving the conversation. And if it drove it vigorously enough, it might then wind up on CBS News that night. Before calling the next person, let me just say that part of the business model is what drives, uh, what drove the CNN producers to say to Margaret, can't you get angrier? And what 
drives what's happening at MSNBC. There is an element of the business model, it's not the only element of the business model, which probably drives us toward the extremes which Cass was talking about, too. Uh, next, uh, next question. And please introduce yourself. Yes, hi. I, I am Nancy Zirkin with the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights uh, in Washington. It is a coalition of, of over 200 organizations, very, very diverse. We see a huge polarization in the media, how our issues are treated, as well as in the communities um, uh, in terms of issues, especially immigration, one, uh, single-sex marriage, two, and affirmative action, three. I'm fascinated with all the comments today, and I'm especially fascinated because I have spent the past two days doing panels and other things in the big tent. And that's, that is the tent where there are 500 bloggers and um, there is a stage and it's not as fancy as this. And it's very informal, but all the blogs are there. And so it's a, it's a way in for our communities. The problem is, is that as you all have pointed out, everybody's talking with each other. So that my question is this, do you all see how it is possible to integrate both the traditional broader media, which is very, very important, and this new media? How can this bridge be gapped so that we all benefit? Thank you. Well, it is kind of bridged, isn't it? I mean, we feed off each other. I mean, the blogs, uh, I'm glad they're there where Nancy's doing God's work with uh, her organization. Um, but in general, or a lot of the time, the blogs are feeding off the old media that's spending the money to actually be there. Uh, because they're not in their pajamas all day, typing away, but they're not in Baghdad either. Uh, for the most part, and they're not up on Capitol Hill. A lot of them are just playing off the conversation. Something's driving the conversation, as John says, and then it has about 100 iterations that day in the, in the blogosphere. So in many ways, I think it's, it's already together. When somebody, say, at the leadership conference has a story idea and comes to uh, old media, Unless there's a f friction, unless there's some controversy, unless there's some provocative activity, it, it's unlikely to become a story. Whereas you can have, you know, the smaller niches come and write stories when there isn't that. You don't need, you know, some Republican senator and some Democratic senator at odds over it. It can just be covered, which I, I think is a good part where they're not feeding off the media, they're actually where you are, writing about what you're doing without the need to have it be a story that's a he said, she said story. Karen, you kind of blend both in a way in time. Do you want to comment on this at all? You know, I, I don't, I think <clears throat> when and where it's gonna happen is when some outside force imposes a crisis. For instance, I think healthcare has now reached the point where enough, you know, 50 million Americans don't have coverage, where business are, you know, just up in arms about the costs. And I think that that may be finally where in 1994, you know, people didn't perceive a crisis and therefore people wouldn't talk to each other. There was no persuasion going on. There was no opening of minds. I mean, maybe I'm being foolishly optimistic and naive, but I do think that given the right set of circumstances and given the right set of problems, people can talk to each other. Uh, before we turn to the next question, let me ask this question. Could I have hands of people who were bloggers? Interesting. A lot of bloggers in this room. And just out of curiosity. Do I insult how anyone? I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> how many I of read you all the time. <laughs> how many of you are blogging this event? <laughs> please, the next question. They're under their clothes. The next will. question, and please identify Great. yourself. Yes, I'm Deborah Gill Mason, and I live in Leland, North Carolina. That's in Brunswick County, North Carolina, and we are somewhat a battleground state. 
I just want to just mention to the panel and to the audience here, when you think of soccer moms and some of the other descriptions that you give of moms, I don't think you really are very inclusive with someone like myself. When I get my media, the first thing I listen to in the morning is the BBC. My husband, he works um, always out of town or out of the country, and so the only thing that keeps me um, in tech is listening overnight and hearing what's going on overseas, because I do believe we are a global village. And what I would like to see uh, is more people of color in, in the blogs, in Time Magazine, um, in just general media, because I don't see it. I only see if something's happening um, that will affect um, a people of color or African Americans, then you find all blacks I've never heard of in my life, if they're not in NAACP, which I'm a part of, Jack and Jill, Delta Sigma Theta, I had to throw that out for those others who's out there. If I don't hear it through my network of friends and operatives, I don't hear it at all. Um, case in point, um, I, when CNN did the pr um, program Blacks in America, and then some of the blogs and some of the chat rooms said, well, why are you doing blacks in America? You can do whites in America. So it goes on and on. But I guess the thing that I really enjoyed hearing about that was the Italian magazine, Italian Vogue, did something about blacks in the modeling industry and that there's a blackout in modeling. And not that I'm into modeling or for se, I bought that magazine to support, I paid $15.95 <laughs> 10 times gave it to friends all over the country. We couldn't read a bit of Italian. I'm Catholic, so we don't have it there. We have it in Latin, maybe I can hear a little bit of that. But I just think you should be more conscious because if you are, people will buy your, your, um, your mainstream media or even a blended media. So I think you need to be very conscious of so well, you know, like one myself. thing is with uh, one of the good things about uh, bloggers, because a lot of them are at home in their pajamas or not, is you don't know what you don't know what they look like. Mm -hmm. You know, there and and anyone can blog. So uh, diversity is certainly coming that way. Well, one one thing I'd like to to point out to the audience that some of you may not know is that in many markets. The number one news show is actually a Spanish language news show. And in Los Angeles, I think the number two, the first and second shows are Spanish language. So a whole other element uh, is the importance of Spanish language media. And at the same time that the daily news outlets are, are having trouble in America, the Spanish language daily news outlets are largely growing in America. So it's a part of the news operation as we talk about diversity that we should very much keep in mind. The next question, and please identify yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Larry Hunter. Uh, I'm a research scientist and professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And uh, I have a question for you about the role of facts in journalism. <laughs> John, you, you said you were proud of the uh, profit-driven nature of contemporary journalism and how you're out there making money. And Margaret, you, you told us about how the audience, you know, wants the dog food, okay? They like extreme views. you got to have confrontation to make it interesting. You know, get more angry. And I think one of the casualties of this, is, as Cass so nicely pointed out, is the loss of a shared set of facts that we're all kind of working from. And I think that uh, opens the door to powerful, um, I'm sorry, Juan isn't here, but often corporate interests uh, to sow fear and uncertainty and doubt, to use a phrase that's applied to Microsoft often, uh, for their own benefit, and uh, effectively so, particularly I think maybe in uh, the face of some of the really deep challenges that face us as, as citizens, uh, uh, say climate change, that's not the only one, but where a shared factual basis is really critical, I think, for reaching an informed opinion that will get us to the point where we don't bake ourselves. So, okay, let's, let's, I got a question, yeah. I really do, I'm getting there. Um, so, how can the conflict between the profit-driven needs of journalists serving a fractured audience and the role of journalism to bring facts to citizens be reconciled? Well, if, can I take a little bit of that question, at least? May I? I think that the media, the mainstream media, is much more willing than it was two or five years ago to state something is true or not true. And I think global warming is a terrific example of that. In mainstream media, it is basically 
accepted now that it is happening and it is, I mean, Time Magazine, we have done any number of covers. We don't do these, oh, when there's a big argument going on, is this really happening and does man have anything to do with it? We are now willing to state in a way that I don't think we did a few years ago on these sorts of things, it's happening, scientific consensus has arrived there, and what are we going to do about it? I think you saw the same thing with the New York Times in the very emotional debate over vaccines <coughs> and whether they had any sort of connection to autism. I, I think the media is actually doing a lot better job. All the amount of fact checking that is now going on about political advertising, where, where reporters are willing to say, he's lying, is, is I think have, has come a lot, in the far, very far in the last few years. I think there's a really profound point you're making, that, and I'd like to put the spotlight on the new media rather than the old media, where the spread of falsehoods in an instant among very large groups, this is unprecedented in the history of the world, and climate change is, is one, maybe the most dramatic example, where many millions of Americans believe things, and th these are smart people, by the way, and uh, patriotic people who, because of the information sources they have, believe things that are preposterous. That's maybe the, the, the poster child of it. But with respect to things that, that Senator Obama believes and did, and sen things that Senator M McCain believes and did, hundreds of thousands or millions of people believe things that are ludicrous. And this is, I, on balance, the internet, in my view, is a very good thing for, thing for democracy. But this is really destructive to the effort to, you know, have a, have a civic culture in which we govern ourselves. We only have a few minutes left, and what I want to ask people to do, I'm going to try an experiment here, and that is to ask people to come up and just state very briefly what your question is. Everybody who's online here, and then we'll have answers to the thing as a group. Before that, let me say that Andy Kohut, a great pollster many of you know, uh, has given talks in recent, the last couple of years about how for the first time in his history, at least, that he knows about in polling, they're finding that people are making decisions based on different sets of beliefs in facts, wow. what they're convinced is facts, not just different opinions. The people are convinced of facts that are different from one another, and whatever the reason for that, whether the media or something else, or the internet, it is a, it's, a, it's a serious question for democracy. Uh, one sentence question from each of you, and then we'll have answers from the group. And you identify you? yourself as part yeah. of the question. <laughs> uh, my name's Alan Silberberg. I'm the CEO of u gov which is a social networking site for politics. And um, in, in short, a very short question, there's a lot of energy and excitement about how the new media is attracting young voters to uh, the political system, but there's not a lot of discussion on how those people are going to be kept. So I'd like to hear your input. Okay, next. Okay, um, so my name's Ian Henry. I'm from Occidental College. I'm originally from Colorado Springs, and I have to tell you I appreciate your anecdote about the cocoon effect because I'm one of five Democrats from the city. <laughs> um, but, uh, but on to my question. Um, so my, my question, I hope this isn't me just being young and optimistic, um, but I'm wondering how much is this uh, uh, hyper-partisanship that, that we speak of reflective of the times? So uh, many would say that the current administration is far less moderate and far more ideologically uniform than the previous administrations, and given the cyclical nature of the presidency, I want to know in the future, is Fox News going to look more like MSNBC? Is this just, you know, um, reflective of the times? My name is Kara Bartlett. I'm also from Occidental College. Um, I just had a question. Again, maybe this is me being young and ideological. You talk a lot about demise, um, and I look at the internet and the new media and see a lot of promise and opportunity, and that you can find out instantly in many mediums more information. So for instance, just a quick anecdote, when Biden was nominated as the VP or selected, I went on YouTube and I looked at quotes of Biden saying what Biden wanted to say and found 150 videos and I got to watch him saying these things. So just talking about the kind of brighter side of the new media. Thanks. Hi, my name is Joel Ebert. I'm from the University of Illinois Chicago. Um, you'd mentioned that fact checking has come a long way over the past few years. Um, with that, uh, you look at the different perspectives that we have on the coverage of the Iraq war. The mainstream media, I think it was argued, they were complicit in how we entered the war. And 
and I would still argue that the coverage of it now has not really changed. I think in order to find the reality of the war, you have to turn to the independent media. You, you have to look to <clears throat> sources like Jeremy Scahill, um, you know, alternative sources. So with that in mind, um, can you really say uh, something about the state of our coverage and, and, and war coverage specifically? I'm thinking, uh, are we getting the entire that's, story? That's as many semicolons as you mm -hmm. get. <laughs> are we getting the entire story with Georgia and Russia? Because I don't think we are. Hello, my name is Sylvana Nagib, and I'm a lawyer from Chicago. I'm also a blogger um, at the blog. I don't know if this is, it's a little vulgar. It's called Bitch PhD. Um, and uh, my question is directed, <laughs> my question is directed towards part, Professor yeah. Sunstein. I actually read your paper when I was in law school, I think, and maybe it's newer than that. And you talked about uh, the, the cocoon effect of having these blogs, so conservative blogs or liberal blogs where like-minded people gather, and the way that that detracts from the discourse. But what about um, the way that it adds to our civic discourse intellectually, because by bringing people who are sort of on the general same page to talk to each other, they can refine their views and increase their knowledge rather than shouting at each other from across the aisle, which happens in a lot of places where people find themselves on complete opposite sides of the spectrum. My name is uh, Harold Kimball. I'm a retired civil engineer and bridge designer from Chicago's South Side, the hometown of Senator Obama. And I'd like, first of all, to thank all the ladies and gentlemen for not wearing an American flag on their lapel. <laughs> My question is very simple. There are a lot of us Americans who are really fed up with the Guantanamo program and the School of the Americas. They're an abomination. They're contrary to American ideals. And I don't know what Senator Obama and Senator McCain have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Natalie Strombeck from uh, Lakewood. And um, I was wondering, there's a story that I believe isn't being told very much, it's under the radar, and would you be willing to tell this story or talk about it? And that is how we in the middle class are being affected badly by this mortgage meltdown. I cannot get a mortgage right now. I have high credit scores. You know, everything about my uh, financial statement is excellent. I've been turned down by five banks for a mortgage because they flip from giving money away down to not giving to anybody. And it's, it's just shutting down part of this economy. And I'm just wondering, it's, it's under the radar, nobody's talking about it. And um, I've got information if you'd be willing to do it because it's a big story. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susie Coyle from Topanga Canyon. I'm an independent filmmaker and a writer, and I do political satire on YouTube. I have a, my own channel. It's called The, Ch the Truth Report. Um, in the past eight years, I've been very frustrated, to say the least. I was blaming the Bush administration for what was going on in the world, but when I looked deeper, I realized it was not just them that failed us. It was the media that failed us. It was the UN that failed us, and it was the world that failed us. Um, I look to the new media um, because sense, I'm frustrated. One sentence question. I wanted to ask you if you will have the courage to exercise more courage uh, for the new uh, administration, and in regards especially to asking the follow-up question, which is always seems to be able to they get away from, and to pin our politicians down and really get some straight answers. Thank okay, thank you all for all those questions, and let's go through the panelists and see anything that they would like to answer on that. Margaret, anything you'd like to? I'm too old to remember all of it. Um, <laughs> um, well, the mortgage thing, it seems to me, actually, the subprime mortgage crisis has really been covered, actually, pretty well. Um, um, well, the front page of the New York Times business section was all about the middle class um, Mortgage meltdown, we're, actually, I should this tell week. You, There's a lot gonna, of that. As soon as the panel ends, we're going to have a reception outside, yeah. which is one of the things we want to get to. And if you have particular questions you want to ask about with individual members yeah. of the panel, you can do it then. Yeah. And on, you know, Guantanamo, I think at the, at, at the debates, 
Um, the questions, more questions fall into what uh, was written up by Richard as category three questions, which are the kind of gotcha questions as opposed to the category one questions, which get you to Guantanamo. But I do remember Mitt Romney saying he would double the size of Guantanamo. So we did get an answer there. And if he's the vice presidential nominee, uh, we can probably hear more about that. Um, and, you know, about getting at the truth, I mean, I, I started out working for Ralph Nader, and then I went to law school, and then I became a journalist because I thought it was a way to do that. So I don't think, like nobody goes out to write a bad book or make a bad movie. I don't think journalists go out not to get the story. And the truth report uh, person who, who asked that, I would just say that no one has a bad heart about it. Um, we try. Thanks, Karen? I do think there's a, a misimpression, and there are three of us, all of us have been White House reporters at one time or another, uh, where you see what goes on in the briefing room and you assume that that is what covering the White House is. Um, when in fact, I hardly ever used to even bother to go to the briefings because they really are theater. The, the really hard questions I think do get asked. You don't always get the answer, but I do think they do get asked. And I can point you to, you know, yes, the New York Times blew the run-up to the war, but McClashey got it right. Um, y you know, Charlie Savage won a Pulitzer Prize for, for going down and really looking at, at how the Bush administration was working in the bowels of the bureaucracy. So just because it's some, sometimes, you know, you're watching the show on TV and the, the briefing looks like a, a bunch of nitwits, um, there is good, solid reporting. And there are going to be people who get things wrong, but there are people out there who get things right. And I think it's up to the consumer to reward the people who are getting things right. And, you know, right now, McClatchy, which got the war right, is having massive financial problems. So. Cass? Okay, they're great questions. Uh, I love the point about the promise and opportunity of the internet. And while we've paid attention to its unfortunate side, this should not be overlooked. The unbelievable ability of people to get, if they're curious, topics and points of view that are unfamiliar. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's new and great. Uh, the suggestion that the hyper-partisanship of the last few years might be temporary and a function of the times, that's a very interesting speculation. I think the trend lines are inconsistent with it, that each person's capacity to create a daily me and to self-select into uh, a very comfortable place, uh, that's not going to go away. And, uh, uh, it would be unlikely if the architecture of control that we now have doesn't create uh, a kind of permanent hyper-partisanship. Uh, the suggestion that cocoons of like-minded people also have uh, a good side, that's a, that's a terrific point, and it is accurate that if you think of the, the fall of apartheid in South Africa, the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, the rise of the women's movement in the United States, the rise of the civil rights movement in the 60s, all of these were made possible by virtue of cocoons of, uh, of like-minded types who could test ideas, hear each other's perspective, and charge one another up. So it does have a fortunate side for the development of ideas within the cocoon. Ultimately, the rest of us can benefit from the development of those ideas. The fear is the existence of simultaneous boulders in Colorado Springs, uh, if they don't meet, uh, can create an absence of mutual understanding which is destructive rather than productive. I think these can both, both be true. Um, uh, on Guantanamo Bay, well, we know uh, Senator McCain is good on torture. Did anyone in the room ever think that we'd be able to say with some enthusiasm that a presidential candidate is actually good on torture? Uh, uh, that means he, he doesn't like it. He's against it. Uh, Senator Obama is terrific on torture. He's really strongly opposed to it, and he would close Guantanamo Bay. Thank you, John. Yeah, and I wanted to go back to a question even uh, just before the, uh, the lineup uh, on uh, the relationship between the sort of profit motive and journalism. I may not have expressed my point with the uh, uh, precision I wanted. But first off, I've been in the news business 23 years now, uh, a couple decades of that at the Washington Post, and a couple of years on my own. And it's literally true that not once during that period, 
Not once, not ever, had I ever from an editor or a publisher or a colleague uh, had the question of, uh, well, we should do this story or we should not do that story because of how it would affect our uh, advertiser relationships. It just doesn't work that way. My point, uh, and I do believe it, is that it is only uh, publications that are financially secure uh, that exist in a, in, a, in a marketplace that can produce the kind of uh, independent journalism uh, that people, I think, want and that has the self-confidence and the, the sort of resources and wherewithal uh, to challenge power uh, and uh, 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 both uh, official government power and private power uh, so that you don't have to worry about those things. Uh, uh, that's why I think that uh, a, a viable economic model is important, uh, not that we, uh, um, at least in my experience, like go chasing after stories because we think, like, ah, oh, that's going to send our ratings up and that's going to be good for profit or we better stay away from that story because it's going to advertisers going to be ticked off and it's going to cost us a bundle. It's just alien to my experience. Um, I do, I think, and uh, I say tentatively because Cass would have much more uh, uh, data to, to support his view. I actually have a kind of sympathy uh, with, uh, uh, with the young woman who, I, if I understood her point correctly, uh, suggested that the hyperpartisanship might not be, uh, um, might be sort of a more passing phenomenon. I guess I have a hunch that's true, uh, uh, in part just because at the most practical level it's not a particularly satisfying place to live uh, with only people you know, shouting at each other and, or, uh, and uh, only people who uh, agree with you. Uh, I mean, if we had to listen, it might be fun to listen to Rush Limbaugh or to Fox, uh, uh, you know, or the equivalent on the left for a while, but you'd go crazy if that's all you, that's the only place you lived. Uh, I think what could be happening is that, first off, you've got a change in the media infrastructure that does allow these, uh, these communities of like-minded people merging with a much older phenomenon, which is the, uh, uh, the ideological and cultural battles of the 1960s uh, that will continue to be fought in our political culture until those people are in the grave. I want to tell you on behalf of a school of journalism and communication that we love these issues because they're never going away. And on behalf of people who are political journalists, you know that they're never going away. So please join me in thanking uh, at Ron Williams, who's left, uh, and uh, Margaret, uh, Karen, Cass, and John, and our partners in political. Thank you all very much.